Hey there, folks. In this interview, I'm sitting down with Adobe's Josh Haftel. Uh, he's in charge of all things mobile over at Adobe. We're going to talk to him about what's new and what's coming up in the world of mobile photography. This is Twitter. All right, if you are like any other photographer on the planet, you probably have awesome gear, but you also have an awesome smartphone that you probably take most of your photos with and probably most of your important photos. Josh Haftel is at Adobe. He's the guy that's in charge of this stuff. And he's the guy that is gonna help you understand, at least today, understand the ecosystem that you should be kind of operating in when it comes to managing your digital mobile assets. Josh, welcome back, man. It's good to see you. Hey, thanks a lot for having me back. Really appreciate it. Yeah, it's always good to have you on, man. I, it's, I love picking your brain about this stuff because I always come away with like, you know, a better insight into how I should be managing my digital assets. Mine, confession, are all over the place right now. <laughs> so I just, you know, I, I it's just, totally fine. I feel like a digital hoarder right now. I need to. I need some some help. Pronounce herder. Herder or hoarder? Yeah. <laughs> so so let's just Sorry. let's start let's start with a little a uh, little bit of background. You're like I mentioned in a little tease there. You're the mobile guy at Adobe at Adobe. What are you doing? What is your main your main thrust of uh, of your day to day operations? Yeah. Um, well. My name is Josh, like you said, and I am a product manager at Adobe. I'm focusing on mobile photography. So basically helping uh, to figure out how Lightroom on mobile devices, Android, iOS, Chrome OS, iPads, et cetera, all can work out in a really, really great way to make photographers' lives easier. So that's that's my focus. That's fantastic. And that's good. So I've got a, I, you know, we were talking about before I started recording, there's a list of things I want to run through, but give me a lay of the land right now. So the, you know, you, you are one of those people that I put in the category of you are like the de facto expert, you know, because this is what you get paid for, obviously, but you love this stuff as well. But you're the de facto expert in the world of mobile photography. There are so many options out there for photographers to choose from. I mean, we've got the Smug Mug Flickr acquisition, we've got Facebook, there's Google, there's Apple, there's, you know, and then there's obviously Adobe with that ecosystem. What do we do, man? I mean, like, where, where, tell me, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I just walked to the top of the mountain, now I'm asking you, okay, what do I do, Josh Haftel, with all my, with all my digital assets, where should they go? Yeah, so, well, I mean, there's lots of different options. There's lots of different ways of doing it. And uh, I'm not here to say uh, that there's one right way or one uh, or another wrong way. Um, what we've been doing at Adobe is we've been trying to build a, a mechanism that allows you to have your images with you at all times. And so that's where you know, the, the, we, Adobe has a thing called Creative Cloud. Um, last October at Adobe Max, we released and announced uh, Lightroom CC. Uh, it was kind of a a new version of Lightroom CC, even though there was a Lightroom CC before that, mm -hmm. the old version of Lightroom CC became Lightroom Classic CC, and the new product came out as Lightroom CC. Um, we won't go into the name right now. It's uh, yeah. Don't make me go into the name. <laughs> it has been it has been confusing to, to folks, and uh, there's there's reasons, there's rationale, but let's let's just we'll just put that aside for the time being and just say this all new Lightroom CC. Uh, the focus of it has been to create a, a cloud-centric product. So that means that your images stay in the cloud. Uh, and whenever you need them, it fetches them from the cloud as needed. And of course, there's lots of ways of, of being able to say, well, you know, I'm, I'm going to be on a desert island for a while. I won't have access to the cloud. What should I do? Well, store them on your iPad, your Chromebook, your Android, your iPhone, whatever you're using, store them there. But then you have access to them even when you're offline. But the idea was that instead of worrying about where do your images live? Instead of worrying about my images are here or there or this other place, you just want to say like, I have my images, I have access to them. So I, I put them into the system, into the ecosystem, uh, into the creative cloud. And from there, I can access them on any one of my devices. And so Lightroom CC was, was brought up about with that uh, concept in mind. What's interesting is that Lightroom Mobile has done that since its inception. Yeah. So that means like Lightroom Mobile is I don't know, about four years old right now. So it, it predates Lightroom CC Desktop, the product that we're now now known as Lightroom CC Desktop, predates that by about a good two and a half, three years in that it created this uh, cloud-centric, cloud-native experience a long time before that. So that meant 
with Lightroom Mobile in the in the past and to this day, you add an image into it, it uploads it to the cloud, it stores the original in the cloud, and then it just references the original whenever it needs to. Because one of the biggest things that I think most of us are familiar with, especially um, when you're doing a lot of photography, is running out of space on your phone. Right. And so the last thing you want to do is get to the point where you're like, all right, cool, uh, I took 10 photos and done. Well, what do you do next? Like, I'm on a trip, I'm on vacation, I want to do more with this stuff. So that was Lightroom CC's concept was take the images and only keep locally what you need. And there's a couple ways of doing that. But the idea is you put your images in Lightroom CC and Lightroom CC will manage the images for you. And then we have built into the application a bunch of different search and organizational features that'll help you find those images because it doesn't do you much good if you've got your photos and you know that you have some photos, but you just can't find them. That, that does nobody any good. Yeah. So, so, so the, the, so the, the, what I want to get uh, some clarity on, and this is, this is so cool that you're here is the, who's, who's Lightroom, who is Lightroom classic for, and who is Lightroom CC for, um, is the main thrust in, in other words, in my circles, professional photographers and advanced amateur photographers, they look at, uh, Lightroom CC as like, there's no way I could use that because it, it's, it's inhibited. I can't do all, all my tools aren't there. And you know, it, it feels like it's a consumer level application, which is not necessarily a bad thing, obviously, as proven by lots of large companies, you know, uh, but they feel like, you know, Hey, I'm a pro photographer. I need this tool set that have, I've grown to love in the old version of Lightroom. I have as Adobe forked and said, you know what, we're going to create this version of Lightroom for, people that shoot mobile photography and everyone, and then we'll have this version of Lightroom that's for the pros that, that need this heavy horsepower stuff. Is that? Def definitely not. Um, okay. So I think that part of that perception, there's a couple of things where that comes from. Um, when Lightroom CC, the all new Lightroom CC came out in the, in the beginning, it was, and still is, but it was even then missing more features, especially some features like, for example, it didn't have a curves tool. And a lot of professionals were like, how am I supposed to use a tool that doesn't have the Curves tool? Yep. Well, the Curves tool was added in in December. So like two months after it was released, a new update came out, added more features in there. So you can imagine that when you look at a product and you're like reading it and reading about it, and especially when a uh, product is first released, that's when you'll have the most attention to it, the most articles and press reviews written about mm -hmm. it. And at that time, it didn't have all the features. And, and how could it? Like, how would you expect or would you even want to try and create a product that it has all the same features and functionality of an 11 year old product. So when Lightroom CC came out, we knew from the beginning and from the get go that it wasn't gonna have a one-to-one -one feature parody. And in fact, that's never been the goal is to create a one-to-one -one feature parody. We're not just trying to create Lightroom classic with a new coat of paint. We're trying to basically come at it and say, well, these are two different products and there's two different experiences that they have. And that's where it gets back to your question of like, who is it for? So Lightroom CC is, as I mentioned before, this cloud native experience. And so that means that the images live in the cloud. That means that you have access to those images anywhere. And, and there's a benefit to that, which is I can have, uh, I got my iPhone right here and I've got 7.5 terabytes worth of images that I can access directly from my phone wherever I am in the world. Yeah. And because of some of the tools like smart previews, which basically take your 80 megabyte uh, raw files and make, turn them into a one megabyte proxy file that you can access quickly and still have the ability to full level of editing at a lower resolution. I can actually, with only uh, one megabyte of, of data transfer, have access to any of those hundreds of thousands of images that I have access to, again, anywhere that I am in the world. So that's, that's a really cool benefit that I'm just able to be anywhere that I am, have access to all of my images. If somebody calls me up and like, hey, I would love uh, to license XYZ photo from you, I can actually take care of it off of my phone wherever I am, and I have access to lots and lots of photos. Yeah. Now, that does mean that I got to put all those photos into the cloud. Some, some people, they don't want to put their photos in the cloud. Some people don't want to have access to those images uh, that, that's not important to them. Their, their focus is, I'm working, I've got my computer, this is my like digital darkroom, so to speak, I've got my images on my hard drives, my RAID, and i got everything ready to go and access them. And when I do my photography, I'm in my photography space. And for me, that's all I want, and, and that's fine. And Lightroom Classic continues to have a lot of engineers working on it, continues to have new features being added into it. We're now working on Lightroom Classic to do focus on the, the things that the photographers who are using Lightroom Classic rely on it for, which is improving speed and stability. And so those are the majority of the effort, energy, and focus that we have the team working on is to just answer those kinds of needs. So to answer your question, you know, for the first part of it, like, 
part of the reason why some people may perceive that Lightroom CC is not a professional tool is because when it was originally released, it didn't have all the same features. To this day, it still doesn't have an exact one-to-one -one capability mapping of Lightroom Classic. Like for example, today, you can't do things like Panorama or HDR inside of the application. And those things are being worked on. So they'll, they'll be coming at some point in some uh, way, shape or form. But again, it does different things. So we're looking at uh, if you're really interested in having this kind of anywhere access to your images, uh, you have that. The other side of it, though, is like, you know, like why people might use Classic is that on Classic, again, the only thing you need is access to hard drive space locally. Um, because Lightroom CC is cloud native, it does need the images to be stored online. And because online storage does cost money, uh, some people are like, you know what, I don't really need that. Or it, it doesn't really align with, with like the benefit doesn't outweigh the cost for me yeah. personally. So therefore... I don't want to get into it. So th there's no right or wrong in that. Um, and I think there's also a secondary part of it, is, which is you got a product like Lightroom Classic. It's you know 11 years old right now. People are familiar with it. Uh, familiarity, especially a, as a working professional, is mm -hmm. key. You know, like part of the thing. Whenever I teach people about taking photos, the most important thing I tell them is like, don't just switch around from body to body to body. Find a body that that works, that fits, that it kind of feels as natural as possible, and then learn it. Learn inside and out, you know, be able to blindfold yourself and be able to like change all those dials and settings and things because that's what's going to really make or break you as a photographer. The ability to capture that decisive moment, as they say, to be able to capture that image right at that exact moment, like without having to like stop, look down at the camera, yeah. like, oh, where's that button again? You got to you know, know your weapon. That. Yeah. You yeah, got to know your exactly. weapon. Yeah. So, so, so that for that reason, that's that's why Lightroom Classic to this day, like you know, they know their tools, they know how it works, and so the last thing you need as a working professional is something kind of coming in out from from the side. And we get that. And there will be time where hopefully over time we continue to add more value into the Lightroom CC, and then folks can take a look at it and say, well, actually, this product is really cool. I'm interested in trying it out. Or again, if if they're happy to use Lightroom Classic, Lightroom Classic is not going anywhere. That, well, that was that. my next question. That was, that was literally my next question. I mean, all that sounds great. And, and yeah, and obviously it's, it's going to be a use case, right? What, what's your work? What's the workflow that works for you? And what's the right tool for, for the right, right job, but looking forward. And I know, you know, I, I, I ask this very carefully because I know you can't answer questions about unreleased or product strategy and all that stuff. But are we looking, I mean, is the vector towards a merging of these applications, CC and classic down the road? Are we going to see them just become one, one code base, or is it going to continue to be a fork in the road where we see each one developed individually? Yeah, I think that the hardest thing is e even, like, well, I'll say it this way. I don't even know what the future looks like because we're still at the beginning of, of this process of developing this product that makes uh, and, and working with photographers uh, to figure out what they need and what they want. Yeah. So one of the things that I think is really exciting about working on the Lightroom team, and, and you can see this throughout the history, but even go back to before Lightroom was released, Lightroom came out as a beta for one year. Like it was a public beta yeah. that we asked people and we invited them to come in and try it out and let us know what they wanted. Our entire goal and strategy as a, as a team inside of Adobe is to work with the photography community to build the product the photography community wants. Yeah. And to do that in like concert, not kind of like, we're not trying to stand on the hill and be like, here's the product for you, use this. It's more like, hey, what do you need? What's, what's the thing that you want? And, yeah. and how can we build this together? And so but from that perspective, what we're doing right now is we're saying, we know there's an opportunity for this cloud centric experience. We've seen this, we've already gotten a really great response from Lightroom CC up until now. And we're excited about how things are going and we're excited about how things are growing. But we're also getting a lot of people saying, hey, Lightroom Classic, that's my product. That's what I want. Mm -hmm. And so what's not clear just yet is will either of these products supersede the other? Yeah. Will they continue staying separate? for, uh, for as, as far as I can tell from where I stand right now, for the foreseeable future, they will definitely be the two products. And as far as we're concerned, we're, we're continuing to focus on Lightroom Classic and we're not operating in any way, shape or form other than it is a product that people love. People love using it and frankly, they pay for it. Right? And, and as a company, like our most important thing is we want to build a product that people love and enjoy and are willing to pay for. And as long as that's the case, then, then we're going to continue doing that. Right. And it's interesting because I, I hear these arguments all the time about, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah but you're going to get rid of Lightroom Classic. And I'm like, what about FrameMaker? 
and InDesign. <laughs> yeah. Look at those two products. You know, FrameMaker is what, 30 years old right at now? At least, yeah. Still being made, even though ostensibly InDesign was the killer FrameMaker application. Right. You know, like you, you theoretically you wouldn't need uh, FrameMaker anymore now that, that InDesign is out there, but no, we still make it. We're still updated. We're still releasing new features inside of FrameMaker, uh, even though InDesign is what, like 20 years old? Yeah. You know, like, yeah. God, so 20 InDesign, years past. It, feels, it still feels like InDesign was just released. I remember when it came out. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I remember it too. Like, I was in college. So that was in like, oh my God, I'm, I'm old these days. I remember it was like 99. Uh -huh. like it, yeah. Yeah. Because like it was like, oh, and, it's the PageMaker killer, right? Or something like right. that. Yeah. Yeah, and so like these things still exist, and so like that's the whole point is like we're con we continue to focus on the things that photographers, users, artists, creators, whatever you want to call it, uh, are, are needing in their workflow because ultimately we believe that our job, our kind of reason for being as a company, is to empower creatives and make it possible for them to create, and we create the tools that helps creatives create. Their work and that's and, and that's i think that you hit on the head that is why i think in my personal opinion why adobe won the the digital asset management photography lightroom versus aperture war right that apple apple conceded you know victory over to lightroom and i think it was largely because of those two different uh, mindsets or ways of approaching where Adobe approached it from, Hey, let me tell us what you guys want. We'll build it, you know, um, or we'll put it on the roadmap and build it in subsequent revisions. Whereas um, Apple said, Hey, we know what you need. We're going to, we're going to hire smart people and build a product that we think that you need and we'll deliver it unto you and you will love it. Right. So two different approaches, which one, you know, you know, who's right? You, you know, don't know, but a Lightroom's still around. As I, right? as I say this uh, with my iPhone, Apple Watch, MacBook Pro, and iPad. I'm, I'm right guess, there with you, dude. I'm on an uh, iMac recording it's, this. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's not like, I don't think there's any winners or losers in this sense. Like, I, I love my Apple products. I love my Android products as well. Yeah. Um, and I think it's it's interesting to think, though, like, you know, we're, Apple's still winning. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, people, people love a good fight. You know, people love to yeah. like, it's every story has to have a protagonist and an antagonist right. or it's not a story, right? Underdog right. and overdog. Uh, well, <laughs> you know, I want to be respectful of your time. I have a couple things I want to talk to you about. One of them is, uh, or there's two main things. I want to talk about profiles. And then I also want to, I want to talk about the idea of artificial intelligence and how Adobe is using that. We talk about that a lot on This Week in Photo in terms of um, AI, you know, as as applied to image sorting, um, as applied to recognizing things within an image to help you sort or to help you do things to the image. And then on the other side, the computational photography side at image capture time, doing things like you, like you were talking about with your iPhone, where you can you know, selectively apply bokeh after the fact or any number of things. What is Adobe's sort of mindset when it comes to adding artificial intelligence into the things that we do and how we manage our images? Yeah, that's an interesting um, question, of course. The machine learning, artificial intelligence, these things are all top of mind for many people in, in Silicon Valley and, yep. and the tech world at, at large. Um, because ultimately, like the promise of artificial intelligence is how do we help photographers or other users feel like they're able to focus on the things that are important and not have to do the things that are, aren't that important? Mm -hmm. um, and how do we help people do those things? Like basically you, you, you don't want to do like the, the grunt work, the manual labor, that, that's not fun. And so you, you, you mentioned one of those things, which was um, in at Max last year, October of last year, we, uh, along with Lightroom CC, we also released our um, search powered by Adobe Sensei. Adobe mm -hmm. Sensei is the name, kind of the umbrella brand among, around all of our machine learning and artificial intelligence. And so we have an Adobe Sensei branded, uh, basically image analyzation uh, mechanism that analyzes your images, it identifies objects, subjects, uh, even um, emotional kind of like happy, sad, wow. those kinds of things inside of the images and help you find things. So that way you can be like, search for a sad baby. Um, and that may or may not work. Uh, <laughs> but I, mean, I see everybody like, sad baby, go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so it serves for sad baby. <laughs> yes, it's bad. You know, but you know, it's always, it's getting better over time. But anyway, point is like that was one of the first places that we started um, coming out with with tools specifically focused around machine learning and Adobe Sensei technology. But we got other things as well. So, um, we'll, at the at the top level, what we like 
to do is like to think about what are those things that are just either not fun or just repetitive tasks that computers could do really well. And some of those things are um, with machine learning and the ability to do object recognition and pattern recognition, you're able to come out there and say like, oh, we can automatically find all the dogs and like you can search for dogs or waterfalls or blue uh, or skies or clouds or so on and so forth. And, and that's really helpful because that means that you as, a, as the photographer don't have to go there and, and enter in all the keyword image by image. Which by I image hate. By image by image, I hate which, tagging and keywording. <laughs> you know, there are a few people in this world that like it and bless their souls. Uh, I am definitely with you and I hate keywording. I never did it before. So now uh, before I would find, try and find an image, I would just be like, oh, I think it's over there and, and just kind of find it. Now I can actually narrow it down, which is really, really cool. Uh, but that's like one example of it. Another example of it is... Um, we're currently working on, uh, it's a, it's currently released on uh, lightroom.adobe.com, which is like the web version of Lightroom. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a uh, technology preview, which means kind of like a beta, mm -hmm. uh, but it, it's called Best Photos. And what's cool about Best Photos is that it uses a lot of uh, combination of information, including um, artificial intelligence and machine learning, as well as some of the signals that the photographer has given to it. So for example, we have uh, a new machine learning technology that, that tries to uh, determine what would be a potentially aesthetically pleasing image versus a non-aesthetically pleasing image based off of looking at tens of thousands of images and being able to sort and rank them at, at or this is better than that, that's better than this. And why is it like, oh, this one has more uh, separation between the subject and the background. This one has a clear subject. This one doesn't have a clear subject. This one has you know really nice compositional, uh, following compositional rules. This one has some out-of-focus background. Like all of these things that we use to determine uh, and more than that, by the way, but just things that we use to help determine what's a good photo, what's not a good photo, and it's able to learn, and it's getting better and better at learning, like, what would be a good photo versus a, a less good photo, and then it, it also is able to look at, like, a burst of photos and be able to say, oh, these photos are all the same, they're all the same subject, it's just, like, I took uh, 20 photos of my friend's kid, and they were basically, like, some of the photos, they were closing their eyes, and some of the photos, they had a finger up their nose, but, you know, we were able to, like, say all of these are basically the same one, let's pick the best one of these ones, like where the eyes are open, the kid looking at the image, at the, at the camera, they're smiling, they're, it's in focus. And so instead of looking at 20 photos, you're only looking at one photo. And, and so taking all of those kinds of things together and then combining it with things like, did you flag it? Did you rate it? Did you edit it? Did you share it? Because you as a photographer might add some like, all right, I know this one's dark, but it's a really good photo because of this expression. There's still some things that computers aren't really amazing at being able to do, which is like context, yeah. being able to pick up like, oh, the fact that the kid is crying, but it's their birthday party, maybe that's actually a good photo. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, so it, like, it could even look at outside things like, hey, I know, I know Frederick's daughter's birthday is on this day, and this is a photo of Frederick's daughter. So therefore, this is probably more important than these other shots that we're taking when it's not her birthday, you know, that kind of thing. We don't, we don't have things like birthdays, like your daughter's birthday. That, that That's kind of like more of a Facebook uh, thing. <laughs> right. Um, well, but, that's, I want to talk about that a little bit, just a little bit, yeah. not too much, but yeah. But, but what we do have is like, we've got uh, other information and maybe you've gone in there and you've said, Hey, this is a five-star photo. And so through the combination of all the things that we have, either of the image that we know or the information that you've told us about the image, we can then come back with a recommendation of, of these 10,000 photos, here's your top 50 photos. Mm -hmm. um, or of your vacation that you just went to Greece, here's your top 20, top 200, top whatever you, you want. And that way you, you're able to get a really quick pass at it. And it's like I said, it's a technology preview. It's a beta. It's getting better and better. And we're giving more and more controls. But it's just another example of how AI and machine learning is coming together to make your life better. And even a third example is uh, we improved our auto tone, uh, auto uh, edits, auto settings, I think there is the a new official term for it, um, that came out, I think, last October or December. And what the auto settings did was, it again, is a machine learning algorithm that's able to adapt its auto editing, basically moving the sliders to get to a, a nice neutral starting point mm -hmm. um, or kind of like get to the point where, all right, now I can edit this photo instead of spending all my time fixing it and making it, oh, it's too dark, we'll make it brighter. So it's able to adapt from image to image based off of machine learning to come up with a better Qual higher quality starting point. And so that's another example of some of those things where, you know, like how much fun is it to just go in there and like fix your photo? Like nobody likes fixing their photo. They're like enhancing their photos, right. like embellishing their photos. They're like adding like cool effects to their photos. But the, the idea of like taking a photo where you're like, you underexposed it by accident for whatever reason, you know, nobody wants to be reminded that you made a mistake when you're taking the photo. 
Right. So like, just just fix it, fix it for me, and then I'll come back and I'll do the fun thing. And give me so give me to a fun. give me to a good a good starting point. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, what about uh, just quickly? What uh, where, what's Adobe's position on privacy? Right. So if if we're talking about cloud based um, storage of my photos, and we're talking about unleashing Sensei on those photos to look into them at a pixel level and a compositional level and an exposure level and all that, and, and sort of collate all that data and make decisions on it. How does Adobe approach the increasing concern as revealed by, you know, Facebook and all these other companies that are doing nefarious things with our data what is what is Adobe? How do you position yourselves in terms of trying to allay those fears that hey, we're not going to do anything crazy with your stuff? Well, you know, I mean, trying to figure out the the most appropriate way of saying because I got lots of friends, uh, like we're friends and with folks like uh, Facebook, and yeah, Instagram, yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. We don't want to throw anybody under buses, so that's not the intention at all. Um, Ultimately, though, like those companies have to monetize themselves. They right. got to make money somehow. And the only thing that they have is your data, is your information. And so their, their job, like any other job, any other company is to make money. And what are they going to do? They're going to find ways of making money off of you and yeah. figure out how you can, uh, your information, the information about you could be used to either sell you products or you even, are you are the product yeah. if if you're not paying yeah. you're the product <laughs> yeah so like compare that conversely with adobe where you're actually paying for the product you're paying for the service um, right. and so like we are negatively disincentivized or i shouldn't say that that was a double negative we're uh disincentivized <laughs> yes <laughs> i'll work on my i'll work on my logic uh in, in a second but we're, we're we're disincentivized from doing anything with your data. Like you're, we have very strong privacy policies uh, that you agree to and we agree with you. It's kind of a, a, a bi-directional pact that we make with, with you as, as the customer that your data is yours and yours alone. We yeah. cannot use your data to do anything with it other than the stuff that you give us consent to do. And we do not uh, sell ads. We don't sell your data to third parties. We, basically what we do is we use any information and you can opt out for it. It's all kind of laid out inside of the, the information and, and privacy settings. Some of the information we might use to make the product better. And so we do collect some anonymous usage statistics. It's basically completely stripped and it's put into a big pool of data with other people so that we can say like, oh, well, you know, there's a lot of people that aren't using this one feature. We think that feature is really good. But is it because we did a bad job positioning it or the labeling it? Or yeah. why is it that not more people are using this thing? Could we help them find it? Um, and of course, even people have the option of, of opting out of that. Uh, and as you can imagine, like right now, the big uh, the hot news and, and the, the buzzwords or buzz initials are GDPR. And everybody's talking about GDPR these yep. days and the need to provide that level of, of privacy, security, and, and peace of mind for especially European users. But most companies, including Adobe, have taken a lot of the um, stuff that's coming from the GDPR, and, and we've, in some way, shape, or form, have implemented parts of it throughout the Which entire... Which I love. That is, that is fantastic. Yeah, I've gotten, I, I want to say, at least 20 emails over the past couple of days yeah. um, or a week Everybody or so. Like, yeah, we've revised everybody. our privacy policy of how we use your data. You know, it's interesting, right. and some of them... Uh, this is a complete non sequitur, but some of them, you know, they're like, hey, we've, we've provided additional controls to give you more visib visibility into how that we're, you know, into what you're revealing. And you, on some of them, I was shocked. I was like, I had no idea you were, <laughs> you had all this data, you know, so yeah, it's yeah. pretty crazy. So for us, the, our service is to provide you as the, as the creative, a way of creating better, more creative output. And, and yeah. that's what we're doing. And so everything that we do and everything that the reason why your images live on our server is not so that we can monetize your images on our servers. In fact, your images cost us a lot of money on our server. Yeah. And so <laughs> we're, we're not trying to, to do anything other than say, hey, this is the service. You, you asked us to do this for you. Uh, and here's how we're going to make your life better. And giving you the options, like you said, to control what you can and can't do with it. Love it. Love it. Well, Josh, I want to I want to end this um, on um, profiles, which is a big deal. I know Adobe Adobe rolled out profiles a little uh, a while ago um, and I, I I'm foggy on what profiles are and who they are for and more specifically how they're different than what we already had 
So can you can you explain what what profiles are and kind of what the what the gist is? Yeah, sure. Um, so conceptually, we've had presets for a long time, and the, and the idea, and this is where presets and profiles oftentimes get uh, confused and, Me, and mixed yeah. up between one and the other. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's totally uh, expected in some ways because there's some similarities behind them. It's like they're a thing that you click on, and when you click on it, your image changes, and so. The idea of like, well, wait, what's the difference between these two different things? So at the top level, a preset moves the sliders, and that's all it does. Mm -hmm. So you click on a preset, your sliders move. A profile, on the other hand, is actually more like, some people call them a filter. Uh, it's more like a, a actual set of, of algorithms that are processing your image, and they're doing things that are unique. So for example, one of those unique things that a profile can do is something that's called a, a lookup table. Uh, lookup tables have been used uh, in Photoshop or in applications like Premiere, After Effects, uh, in the video world to apply a different kind of uh, effect on your images by mm -hmm. changing the, the relationship of one pixel color to another. And so it says, like a lookup table oftentimes means like all blues turn to green. And that lookup table just means you, you look at one color and then you kind of like just change it to another one. So it's just imagine they're like 3D lookup tables. So there's three dimensions of, and each pixel is just saying, take this green and move it that way. Take that blue and move it that way. And that idea of a lookup table is something that's incorporated inside of a profile. And there's other things that a profile can do as well. But the idea is that ultimately at the end of the day, the profiles are this, their own unique tool that for all intents and purposes, it's not that different from the uh, curves tool or the clarity filter, like these are or clarity slider. These are all things that when you use them, they change the content of your images at a low level. Mm -hmm. However, because of the UI uh, and, and because of the way that you need a, a multitude of these different tools, like you need a multitude of different profiles, just like you need a multitude of different presets. Therefore they, they seem or feel similar. But in the end of the day, uh, there's no one way of saying who's a profile for, who's a preset for, a preset is kind of like, it's, it's you can actually reference a profile in a preset. So meaning you can create a preset and that preset could say, make exposure plus 10, make uh, shadows plus 10 and set the profile to this profile. So you can store all that information in the preset and you can still use a preset as a one click. It just does it to your image. So would, um, a, would, a, would a profile be like for, um, I have a friend that does a lot of infrared photography. Would you, would you set a profile to manage those just out of camera infrared images that look pink or whatever to kind of get them to a starting point? Or would that be a job for a, for a uh, preset? Well, I mean, it depends on if you have the profile. So you, you as a user cannot create the profile. I mean, you can. Um, oh, okay. I've actually right. created a video on YouTube where you can learn how to make a profile. Profiles are not easy to make. Um, they're pretty complex because the idea of a profile is in order to render your image, you need that profile. So that profile, it needs to work under a multitude of different circumstances and situations, and it's always needed. Whereas a preset, you can apply a preset, throw it away, and never worry about it again. And it, it could just it doesn't matter because it's already done what it needs to do. Mm -hmm. But a profile actually needs to live with the image inside of the, uh, the processing system in order to actually come up with that, that look and feel. So th the creation of a profile is, is much more complicated and much harder, and it's not something that you're going to do all the time. Presets, a lot of times, you're like, all right, I edited my photo. Oh, this looks really cool. I want to like save this, and I want to apply this to a bunch of other images later on, and you'd use a preset for that purpose. Whereas a profile, one way of thinking about it is it's not dissimilar to the way you would, as a photographer, have used different types of film. So if you would use uh, Fuji Velvia for your landscapes and Kodak Portra for your portraits or uh, Acros for your really grainy black and whites or whatever different kind of film you might have like gone to the fridge and slapped in your camera and gone out and shoot, that style that was baked into the, the chemistry of that film, it's very similar conceptually to what a, a profile can do. And the profiles are much more powerful and, and you can actually change them after the fact and they can do a lot more things you couldn't have done in the, in the analog world. But ultimately it's like, I'm going to change the look and feel of this entire image. And I can do that with a profile. So uh, a lot of times I find myself using profiles just to add a little style or flair, flavor on top of the images. Um, and in fact, I almost never use presets. Uh, like as, as a photographer, I almost never use presets because presets work really well on the image that you applied them to. But because presets 
they, they like, if you have a, a really dark image and you apply a preset to it, it looks good. Then you take a really bright image, you apply that exact same preset to a really bright image. It's going to look terrible right. because the preset is always doing the exact same things to the image. And usually that's, that's like, if you want to make a preset that doesn't actually, that, that works better across a wider range of images, you basically make a really, really lame preset. Right. So presets have this tendency, like, I, you know, some people find themselves constantly doing the same kind of stuff. They're in a studio, they have similar lighting situations, or they know they're always going to be, if you're a wedding photographer and you know that the after the ceremony photos that you're going to be taking with the golden hour light, is always going to be a certain thing. And you got a preset that works really well for that kind of lighting situation. That makes total sense. Like for me as a photographer, I'm, I don't do one type of photography all the time. I'm, I'm not a, a working professional in that sense. So for me, presets don't really make sense. Uh, because the content, the subject matter that I'm I'm taking pictures of all the time is totally different. So I find myself uh, editing each image to taste and maybe using a profile on top of it uh, to add another more like another layer, another uh, dimension of, of change. That is so cool. So they're, they're very different, but very similar looking. And so a lot of times people are confused by it. And it's, it's more one of those things of like, try it out, play around with them. Um, one of the, like I mentioned before, one of the bigger changes is, of course, presets you can make easily, profiles you can't make easily. So yeah. that that sometimes often um, comes up with what the biggest changes are. Yeah, well, that, that clears it up. It sounds like it sounds like uh, profiles are smart, um, and they instead of instead of like you were just saying, instead of just you know being a preset slider location. It is actually being a little bit more intelligent about the image and looking at the the relationship of pixels between each other and brightness and contrast and all that stuff, and then making decisions on the image versus just, hey, he said he wanted plus three clarity added in this particular preset, so I'm gonna add plus three clarity. With a profile, on the other hand, if I'm understanding you, a profile on the other hand might say, this image, this image needs plus three clarity that image doesn't and and act accordingly no, not really so they're not intelligent like they're not analyzing the image so okay there's about the profiles that are analyzing the images um, but the profiles are going to uh, apply it like they're they're totally different like th that's the hard thing is like if you you know all those sliders that you've got inside of the the preset yep th those are presets that's not a profile. Profile, just think about it more like a filter that you apply different things to. Like I said, the easier way of understanding it is that the difference between like a film, like you'd go out there, you'd say, I would put a different film inside of my camera and I would yeah. shoot with this different kind of uh, film. But the, the presets, the profiles themselves, they don't have inside of them any kind of an intelligence uh, to, 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 to differentiate between one thing or, or the other. But they are, because they're adjusting more low level con controls, they work on a wider range and a wider variety of images. Got it. So it's it's one of those things like many times uh, trying to describe some of these visual things is is oftentimes fraught with peril. It's like, try it out. Yeah, You'll probably try like, it. figure it out when yeah. you use it. Yeah. It's so much easier. Like we're visual people. Like we're trying to describe visual things. It's like, <laughs> how do you describe the color red? It's like, well, man, it's like really <laughs> warm. Like, Warm how? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Describe warm. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool, man. Um, the, what's next for you? And what's next for Adobe? What's next for mobile? What 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 do we have to look forward to in the coming months? Uh, lots of things. Um, we've got a really big uh, release that we're working on for June, uh, which I can't go into obviously, sure. uh, but it's it's a big one, um, adding a lot of functionality across the ecosystem. Um, Basically, like you, you can trace our trajectory from our recent launches and, and you can get a pretty good idea of where we're going with things. We wanna continue to focus on uh, providing a really strong foundation for the ecosystem, making it so that you don't have to think about which, like, I want my iPad to be my domain device, I want my iPhone to be my main device, I want my Android device, I want my Chrome OS device, I want my laptop, my PC, my Mac, whatever. I, I don't want to think about which one of my devices am I working on and still to be successful. Yeah. I want to be just as successful with any one of my devices, regardless. I want to be able to not focus on the kind of the grunt work. I want to focus more on the fun things. I want to like have access to unique tools that, that make me capable of accomplishing whatever it is that I picture in my head and, and bring that to life. Those are the kind of things that we're always focused on, that we're always uh, driving towards is, is being able to empower people, make them more effective, more efficient, 
make it easier. Uh, and everything that we try and do is, is to those ends. I love it. I love it, dude. Thank you so much for coming on today. You're in, you're in New York city right now. It looks like it's almost five o'clock, right? So it's, it is, it's four fifty two. It is. It's almost beer o'clock. You need to get, <laughs> no, but I'm, I'm still on Cali time. So that means it's only one fifty two. So. It is. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. If you're, if you're a California guy, you got to know the three hours. So you're good. <laughs> I know. Exactly. Awesome. Josh Haftel, man. Thank you so much for coming on. I appreciate it. Thank you, Frederick. Appreciate All right. it. All right, man. Take care. This is Twitter.